Welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your host for Commission Ed. All right, Reed. So the theme that's going through everybody's mind right now is something like this. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't know how many times you've seen the movie. I've seen it multiple times. Yep, just twice. The internets are on fire with all things Tom Cruise and Miles Teller and Top Gun Maverick, right? It's the hotness right now. Absolutely. And I think well-deserved. So we're going to take a few minutes. We're going to point out some things we loved, some things maybe we didn't, but uh, we just couldn't pass <laughs> up an amazing opportunity to talk about a seminal moment in film and military aviation history. So we just couldn't pass it up. Yeah, for sure. This episode will contain some spoilers. So if you're one of like the three people out there listening to this podcast that haven't seen it yet, go ahead and push pause. If you haven't seen it yet, please do. The movie has totaled, you know, over a billion dollars by this point and, you know, well-deserved. It absolutely should have done that, right? It is the first of Tom Cruise's films that reached that mark. And he definitely deserves the congratulations, the whole team, everybody that was there working on it with him. Bottom line up front, if you haven't seen it yet, go watch it. It's worth your time and your money. Yeah. And I'm a big theater goer. I think the experience in this one in particular uh, will be hard met. I don't care how big your big screen is. You know, it was good in the theater. So <laughs> worth your time. So Colin, this is a little bit of a departure for us. We don't usually do a lot of recent events, pop culture, societal trends, commentary. Um, and we do that by design, as we've discussed previously. Part of what we do as officers limits our specific ability to express some of those things. So with all that said, why are we doing a reaction video. This isn't kind of our thing. So why are we doing it now? Well, I don't know about you, Reed, but I feel like there's, you know, some pretty solid reasons for it. Number one, you know, you and I are military officers. And so we love military things, especially war movies. And, you know, we're in the Air Force. And so we love airplanes. Um, granted, this is not an Air Force movie, but it definitely feels like it's part of our heritage. You know, the original Top Gun played a big part in shaping the Air Force culture and that in turn shaped us. And so it kind of feels like going home to watch this again and talk about it, right? And the same is going to be true for our audience, right? You know, people who are interested in, in the military and aviation, obviously, they're going to want to watch this movie. So I think that's a good place to start. It's just that it's common ground for us and our audience. But beyond that, it just like I was saying, the original shaped the Air Force culture because it inspired so many people to want to join, not just the Navy, but the Air Force. And I fully anticipate that there will be people who will watch this movie and will want to join as a result, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, without question. That's absolutely going to happen. Well, I mean, we are living in a different age now. You know, this is not 1986 anymore. You know, people customize the content that they consume. They curate the things that they bring into their lives. But I do still feel like that anybody who is interested in this lifestyle of being a military professional, especially if you want to be a pilot, this is going to be something that you're going to watch. Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. So if you haven't seen it, go see it. And when you do, there are some things that, Colin, we wanted to point out as lessons learned. Because if you watch Top Gun Maverick pin on wings two years from now, your life is going to be not what you think it's going to be. If you think it's going to be portrayed as, as what it happens in the yeah. film, <laughs> there are some things that were really good. For sure. And so we're going to start with those. We're going to start with some of the things, especially the aviation-focused things that 
were absolutely real. And I want to give a shout out to one of our fellow podcasters, Jello, over at the Fighter Pilot Podcast. He and his crew have done a series of discussion points about these, and we have gotten some of our highlights from them. So highly recommend going and checking out their Top Gun highlights Mm -hmm. because we got a lot of our info from there. First off, I want to point out that the flying was real. In the 86 version, it was a lot of green screen, a lot of, uh, you know, static aircraft, and they were moving the camera around the airplane and stuff like that. In this time, right. They were actually flying aircraft. They were still moving the camera around the aircraft. Yeah. (laughs) The actors themselves were not responsible for piloting the aircraft, but they were actually in moving flying aircraft when the filming was done. Technology is advanced, which allows for that to happen. Mm -hmm. So the Gs that you see are real. Now they're not eight or nine Gs because like real pilots can barely sustain that. Not much less these actors and actresses. But real flying, which is spectacular, and it really adds a lot, a lot to the action in the film. So highly worth your time. Yeah. The actors went through, like, jump school. They went through water safety. They went through some of the training events that our military aviators do in order to, again, ground them in the seriousness of what they're doing and how important it is. So good stuff out there. Yeah. Go check some of that out. It's really cool stuff. Yeah, for sure. And if this is something that you are interested in, what a great alternative way to like get exposure to what the training pipeline is like, you know, because there's so much now that has been written about what the actors had to endure. Is that the right answer? I think the right word Mm -hmm. in order to be able to function, to be able to do their job in the jet, they had to go through all of this. And so if you are interested in being a pilot, go learn about how the movie was made and you can get that much more detail on you know, what it's like. Yeah. A couple other things that I thought were pretty cool. So at the very beginning of the film, Maverick is a test pilot out at Edwards Air Force Base. And yes, we do conduct tests and evaluation there. So that was cool. Yes, we do. Flying something called that looks a whole lot like another airplane that we kind of <laughs> have. Um, the Lockheed Martin SR-72 Dark Star. So the SR-71, the Blackbird was a Mach 2 plus capable surveillance and reconnaissance platform that we flew back in the mm-hmm. 70s and into the 80s. Still sexiest, most beautiful looking airplane of all time. Still holds almost all of yeah, the records. Yeah, it looks like it's flying Mach 2 just sitting there. Yeah, still holds almost all of the altitude and speed records uh, for a manned platform. And some good stuff that it looks like an aircraft that Lockheed Martin has proposed. And there was some good tech in there. So the idea of a scramjet, again, go look it up. Again, test and eval happening at Edwards Air Force Base. I love the little product placement of the very carefully placed Lockheed Martin logos. You have the Skunk Works logo, (laughs) which is a really neat, you know, their big brain R&D thinker arm of Lockheed. And they had that little logo there. So some really good, cool things they got right, especially when you're talking test and eval stuff. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, it's cool to see how they made so much effort to bring real things into the movie. You know, real flying, real fake jets. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Right? Mm -hmm. Real things like the Scramjet and Lockheed Martin and all that. Very cool. Another real thing that they brought in, the whole thing about testing and flying at supersonic, now hypersonic, speeds and then the crash you know this all pays great tribute and an homage to all the test pilots and especially chuck yeager who first man to break the sound barrier right at edwards you know he crashed doing a high speed test in the nf-104 starfighter and just like maverick does he finds himself out in the middle of the desert survives the crash amazingly and there's this little kid that just like looks at him like he came from space, right? Yeah. yeah. Where am I? Earth, yeah. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, good stuff. <laughs> you can go see the whole thing. You can read about it, but you can go see the whole thing in a movie called The Right Stuff. It talks all about the test pilots there at Edwards and how they were selected for the Mercury program, you know, space exploration. Really fantastic tribute to them. And I'm very grateful that the team made the effort to include all that in the movie. Some other things that weren't real necessarily in the movie, but 
did in fact happen in real life. The bird strike, if you recall, Phoenix and Bob, you know, they get hit by a bird that shuts down the engines on their F-18 and they go down. Thankfully, both of them punch out and where everything else, all the flying in the movie is real. That wasn't real, right? Yeah. They didn't mm -hmm. actually ingest a bird, but bird strikes can and do happen all the time. In fact, there was a Canadian F-18 that was hit by a bird not a couple weeks after the movie released. And just as you see in the movie, immediately their training kicks in. They start going through their bold face, their emergency procedures. That's what this uh, Canadian F-18 pilot did, was able to recover the jet, land safely. Everything's fine. But again, it just painting the reality to those who want to do this thing or those who want to appreciate those who do the thing, that this is part of being a pilot is that you may ingest a bird and you may have to go through your emergency procedures. In fact, you probably will. Yeah. And Colin, you further highlight in our notes here, there are entire enlisted AFSCs whose job it is to control wildlife in and around airfields. So this isn't mm -hmm. just... Yeah. So in the CE squadron, there is what's called entomology, which, you know, entomology outside of the military means like the study of bugs and fish and wildlife and all those things. Within the military, especially in the Air Force, entomologists are the ones who track down and you know, capture and eliminate, in many instances, wildlife, especially on the airfields, because these kinds of things happen. And we're not talking just birds. There may be deer. You know, if you're in Florida, there are alligators that will get on the runway. And it's their job to keep the airfield clear so that operations can happen. And so they're going to be working closely with airfield operations, FAA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, in order to ensure that F-16s are not sucking up alligators into their engine. Yeah, yeah. I actually worked with a guy in Hawaii who was in that AFSC. It was kind of a weird thing that we had arc paths had crossed. But yeah, pretty cool career field. He would go with security forces and hunt hogs. That was his job. Yeah. There are worse jobs. <laughs> in many circumstances, on many bases, it is allowed for people to go hunting because they're trying to control the population of animals that will go onto the airfield. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool thing. Uh, a couple more flying things. Uh, so this one actually caused me quite a bit of, quite a flutter when I saw it. So in the film, uh, Coyote suffers from what's called G-lock. So experiencing G-forces that results in him losing consciousness. We actually talked about this in episode 93 in some of our fitness episodes. And there's a lot of things with this that kind of made me very interested. So one, pilots have a suit. It's called G-suit, right? It squeezes their lower extremities in order to kind of keep that blood available for them to push it up into their head. But most importantly for and me... specifically the oxygen that's in the blood yes. to help them continue to maintain consciousness. Yes. More importantly for me is I actually know someone who's worked on a system called Auto GCAS. And GCAS stands for Ground Collision Avoidance System. Uh, worked with a guy when I was an instructor at OTS. He was a 6'2 engineer and had worked on implementing this technology, which was invented in the late 90s and getting it installed on... U.S. Air Force aircraft, especially the F-16. That was the one he was working on. Yeah. So if you've got time, recommend just YouTube, Auto GCAS saves or something like that. And you will see the system. It's, it's incredible. It uses a bunch of position, speed, location information. And when it detects that the aircraft is going to do what we called controlled flight into terrain, the pilot is not providing inputs to the aircraft to steer away from the earth. It detects that and then it levels out and essentially keeps the aircraft flying and avoids hitting the ground, just like the name. Yeah. It was surprising to me to see in 2022 that the F-A-18 did not have this. So I actually went and looked and indeed in the 2018 NDS, Congress required that the Navy installed auto GCAS on the F-18. The request for proposal is out. So indeed, that F-18 in the movie should not have had auto GCAS, even though I kind of expect it to be there, but it's going to be there in future. All that said, I really did enjoy that scene because it does reflect the very real danger of high-performance aviation. And I liked how the camera kind of like graded out. I don't know if anyone in our audience has lost consciousness or gotten close, 
that's what it feels like. It just yeah, the brownout. Yeah, it just that tunnel starts to form, and you're like, feels like the windows are closing yeah, in. You're like, oh nope, here we come. Nope, nope, nope. And you know, you're fighting it, given whatever situation you're in. I enjoyed that quite a bit and learned something too. So, Auto G Cast coming soon to an FA18 near you. Yeah, other things. So, Maverick's character again. If you haven't seen the film, we're giving away a whole bunch of things. But this whole film was like a love letter to the character Maverick, right? I mean. <laughs> Yeah. And we all want it. We know we do. I showed up. You showed up. I've seen Top Gun in 3D IMAX. Like, we want to see this. We enjoy the character. But I do appreciate that it reflects a flawed character. This 06? Yeah. A broken character. Yeah. He's got some baggage. There are clearly some things going on with him. And because why? Like, let's talk through that. Because, you know, those of us who have seen the movie before... You know, if you haven't seen it and you're still listening, how dare you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Go watch the movie. But because of the original, you know, Goose Maverick's wingman dies in that movie. And, you know, it's a really powerful moment in that movie. Yeah. Uh, how it all comes about. And here we get to see the effects of that moment 36 years down the road. Yeah. And so I do appreciate sometimes Hollywood reflects not as much lately, thankfully, but sometimes Hollywood has reflected military personnel as unflappable, completely unrealistically, incredibly insert your euphemism here. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciated the reflection of Maverick as flawed, as I don't want to say damaged, but as troubled in some ways. He's broken. Yeah, absolutely. And this business is hard. It is a young man and woman's game. It is. It beats us up emotionally and physically. So I do appreciate that it brought some of those elements in. And we'll talk about some of those things later. Yeah. So he has a moment in the movie that it doesn't say outright that he has PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, but it sure seems like it. If nothing else, he's having an anxiety attack of some sort when he sees Rooster, who is Goose's son, behave and look exactly like Goose. Right. Yeah. You know, so there's some really poignant deja vu. And again, that love story that you're telling about with this character and the original movie. But it's also trying to highlight mental health issues for military members, which is good. You know, we're getting better at recognizing and treating mental health within the military and society at large. But certainly, we can do more. We're not perfect at this yet, just like anything else. But it is nice to see that Hollywood is recognizing that this is a thing that members of the military have to deal with. And that is an important point for anybody who wants to pursue this lifestyle, whether you're going to be in the cockpit or not, that you're going to come up against some really stressful things in your life. Yeah. And I like how Maverick's character points that out. Even to Rooster, he's like, if you haven't lost a wingman, you are going to. You know, he highlights that. So, Colin, we've talked about some, you know, the big, especially aviation-related things that we loved. There were some things in here <laughs> that were not great. <laughs> and as any, you know, person who is in this business to some level was frustrated, what are some things that stood out to you that as you're watching this, you know, got the mega eye roll from Colin? Well, yeah. So, I recognize that this is Hollywood. It's designed to entertain, and it did a great job at that. But just as you're saying, we folks in the military look at some of this stuff and we just cringe because it's so not right. And let's just work through these pretty quickly. It doesn't need a lot of attention, but we're going to nitpick some things. First off, the computers that that military has versus what we have. Yeah. <laughs> Don't even get Are me you started. Kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> The speed and the graphics of the computers in the movie is so not what we have in our military. Especially not for the day-to-day. -day. I've seen us create briefing graphics like that, but it's like you turn it over to the tech graphics people and hopefully six months later you've got something amazing. <laughs> yeah. But not for like, you know, some Joe Schmo young airman is like, oh, let me turn over to my graphics expert and create. No, 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 no. that is not happening. And the next one is, so Maverick has a wingman, a handler. I don't know what this person's yeah, role is. like a body man. Hondo. It was weird, right? Yeah. Who is this guy? And what is he doing following Maverick around everywhere he goes? Is he an exec? Is he an assistant? I have no clue who this person is. Because it's not Love real. Love the character. 
Yeah. <laughs> Hondo's character is great, but this idea that an 06 gets like a warrant officer to just follow him and take care of his things. No. And is like going to just, you know, speak his mind to him. Maybe a warrant officer will speak their mind to a commission officer, but. And should at times. Absolutely. Yeah. But he's on the carrier. He's in the test and eval. <laughs> he's in training. Like those are all three different people in the real military. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Classified briefings in hangars just don't happen. No, nope. period. Never going to see it. This one really bothered me, and I don't know why, but Phoenix and Bob, we mentioned the bird strike. They have to punch out of their jet. They survive, thankfully. But days later, they're put onto this mission. And I'm just like, is that really going to happen? You know, Don't you think that they're going to be putting on maybe some convalescent leave? They're going to be put under watch just to make sure that there's no ill effects from ejection? I don't know because I'm not a flyer. Can you punch out of a jet and be put on a mission three days later? I don't know. Yeah. So given, you know, almost certainly the category of aviation incident, I mean, I'm guessing this is, I can't remember the classes, but this is, you know, one of those where you lose an aircraft, they're going to be grounded for a little bit. Mm -hmm. So yeah, totally agree with that whole thing. I love this a little bit, but always seeing generals like micromanaging everything, like these three star <laughs> generals. <laughs> the air boss who has nothing better to do. Yeah. The scene in particular where the three star is literally like walking to the flight line and then walking to the classroom and trying then walking. To find them. Trying to, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Now John Hamm's character is great and he looks good in his uniform and those are great scenes, you know. Him with his aviators on on the flight line looking at a a big row of all these FA 18s that clearly aren't flying like they should be. Excellent, you know, picture. That's one for the scrapbook. But no. Um, we have phones and we have <laughs> yeah. people for those kinds of things, you know, like call people, get people, hey, can you go check on this? Yeah, that. Well, and you're a three star, which means that you are focused on way more than just this one particular mission. Yeah. 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 Anyway, lots of great things about the movie, but those are not them. Some other things that I wanted to point out that are not true in the movie at all, just like the environment where this mission is taking place just does not exist in reality. You know, when the movie was made, we were still in GWAT. It hadn't been, you know, closed down yet. We hadn't pulled out of Afghanistan yet. Because, you know, the movie was originally meant to release in 2019, then it got pushed to 2020, and then COVID happened. And they wanted to wait to release the movie so it could be in theaters because it's that good. Like, it, it needs a movie theater experience for you to appreciate it. And so... If the movie was wrong then, it's all the more wrong now. As GWAT is now done, the current geopolitical environment is completely different with Russia, Ukraine. The enemy, quote enemy, is some unnamed rogue state where pilots fly in black suits, blacked out helmets, black jets. They're flying a Su-57, but they don't tell you that. And you would only know that if you're an aviation buff, right? And so, so much of what we see that's driving, that's foundational to the plot, like the whole reason for being, is just not true at all. In that regard, Colin, you know, it kind of ties very well to the first Top Gun, <laughs> right? So in the first Top Gun, the mythical MiG that they were all, you know, so worried about was actually a U.S. fighter trainer, <laughs> <laughs> and but it had, you know, it was black, big black scary, and it had, you know, the red star on it. And so in those aspects, those things were right. But in the original, they call out a MIG. The enemy at that point was Russia, the Soviet Union, the Cold War. Everybody knew that. Yeah, and they did fly MIGs. So fair. Yeah, the, the current So it's easier to suspend the belief. Where here we're it's just like, like a, Yeah, it's like clues what? together. They took aspects of baddies from all over. So Iran does have F-14 Tomcats. They are a, you know, trying to be a nuclear state. Su-57s are a real aircraft. So yeah, it's like they kind of picked and chose some of the aspects of everybody and just kind of smushed them in together and yeah, but to this mythical baddie. But Iran is not full of evergreens on the coast of... <laughs> with, with snow with snow yeah no yeah so again they like <laughs> or they look like oregon or washington <laughs> they kludged a bunch of things together and so to your point we have an nds and it tells us who our adversaries are 
And I would have liked a little bit more clarity on that because yeah. when we minimize or hide our adversaries, it emboldens them. And so that was a little frustrating to me. I would have appreciated like, yeah. hey, these people are, but I get it. They're a business. They're trying to make money, trying to sell this film in as many places as possible. You can't say country X is who Maverick is fighting. That's a whole thing. So I get it, but meh. Yeah. Okay. Fair. Again, it's meant to entertain. They're trying to make money. I get it. Yes. But for us, those of you that are listening to this, that are interested in joining, be smarter than that, right? Go look up the 2022 National Defense Strategy, NDS. The unclassed version isn't published yet, but there is talking points, a fact sheet that you can look up, and it's very clear on who we are concerned about. And if you're going to be part of this profession, you need to know those kinds of things. You need to know who the enemy is so you can be smarter. All right, last thing for me, and this is just because I'm a weird watch guy. So Hondo uses a stopwatch, a mechanical stopwatch at some parts of the film. <laughs> that stopwatch is only available through like a very limited release. It's an additional watch that comes with a wristwatch. The wristwatch and in fact, IWC does make a Top Gun specific wristwatch that's available for purchase. It's six grand. So I can't imagine what the limited edition with a matching Pell case and like a matching mechanical stopwatch made in Switzerland would cost, but probably in the 10, <laughs> 10 grand range. So that's a nope for me. Uh, I don't see the warrant officer just like walking around <laughs> with like a $10,000 mechanical stopwatch. I'm just going to throw that out there. But cool watches at the very least. I appreciated some of those were good. Yeah, go get yours. Yeah, someday. <laughs> so leaving the watch thing, which was a little silly, uh, there are a couple other things that were in there that were very good that I liked. So in one of the briefings, Maverick makes the statement that your enemy knows your equipment inside and out. And I think that is a healthy position to be starting from. And so I really liked that. We've got some links to some things that may um, be of interest, but in particular, you know, China has stolen F-22 and F-35 technology from us and it explores those things. So that is frustrating. But something to really think about, how much does the adversary know about you? And I will point out that the director of the FCC has recommended to Apple and Google that they pull TikTok from their app stores because TikTok is owned by a Chinese company, which is part of their state-owned enterprises. And the Chinese have direct access into what you do with your time, how you pause on that one video for four milliseconds longer than others. Maybe they'll feed you more information about that topic or whatever. Oh, and by the way, TikTok tells you what content to view. It's not the other way around. Yeah. So uh, we've got a link to a New York Times article all about that. So that's something that we need to be focusing on, Colin. That is like an entire podcast yes. series all in and of itself. Information warfare is something that I'm definitely really learning a lot and thinking a lot about. Just want to kind of pin that up there and get people thinking about that. Yeah, I think it's just so important. I want to foot stomp that. We're not going to put specific names to specific countries to that enemy or organizations to that enemy. Even if they don't know absolutely everything, they know something about our equipment, about our capabilities. And if you want to find the advantage in combat with the enemy, you need to do, as Maverick talks about in the movie, is be unknowable to the enemy. He says that the enemy doesn't know your limits, but you need to. You need to know what you're capable of. And then not actively participate in sharing that information with the enemy. Don't actively play a part in your demise by sharing those kinds of things with them if you don't have to. So I think it's a really important thing that they covered in the movie that most people are probably just going to gloss over and realize how critical it is to what we do. That the enemy knows our stuff and they want to also know you. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely couple other interesting things. So in the film, Maverick is kind of protected, watched over by a very powerful senior officer. Uh, that is real. Mm -hmm. I have absolutely seen that. I have seen people make silly, questionable, dumb decisions, and then it seemingly get handled. And you kind of look around going, what's going on? And they're like, oh, well, so-and-so knows them. Or at one point in time, they worked for so-and-so. And you're like, ah, 
okay, so the three star came in and just kind of took care of this. I've never seen anything that was truly immoral and ethical or like really bad. Some of the stuff Maverick is doing is pretty bad. <laughs> I don't know how he did not get kicked out a few times, but this idea of like a guardian angel senior officer. Ice must have become a four-star general really fast and has just been like watching over Maverick as he promoted to lieutenant commander, commander. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> captain. Yeah, he, he had to get, yeah. <laughs> but this idea that senior officers can and do protect others is real. Now, there's some pros that go with that and there's some cons. Let's look at Patton as a great example of a pro. Patton was kind of a dirtbag in many ways, but he was good at what he was good at and needed to be in that position and would not have been yeah. had a senior ranking officer not been there to kind of protect him. So there's definitely some pros there. Cons, it really hurts. So that's Omar Bradley that you're talking about, you know, the five-star general of the army during World War II. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there's some cons with it, though. You know, obviously, though, Reed, not everybody's going to have a general officer, a senior ranking officer looking over them. But I think the the principle that we can pull out of that is the importance of having a sponsor, having a mentor, having somebody who's got your six that is going to hopefully mentor you out of sticky situations. But if you find yourself caught in one, they can help you get out of it and salvage your career or mitigate damage as best as possible. But again, or even better, maybe you are that officer. Maybe you are that mentor. Be on the lookout for people who are heading in a direction that may or may not benefit them or, or the Air Force. Yeah. So I think that there are still some really useful things for us to pull out of that. Yeah, because I'll tell you, the instant you find yourself truly isolated and truly alone, it's over. It's over. Yeah. We could go on this forever. O six is kind of serving with impunity doing kind of whatever they want. Um, I wish this were wrong. Just giving a giant middle finger to a three-star and his program. <laughs> but there is some elements of truth, some. I wish this were entirely not true, but there are some elements of truth. There is a colonel's group at the Pentagon. Their entire job is to manage colonel assignments. Mm -hmm. And I have heard these words out of their mouths. What do we need to do to keep you in the military? Just like writing a blank check. Yes. And their job is to cash it. Oh, you know, never been to Tokyo. I'd love to your gig in Tokyo. They will <laughs> figure it out. Like that's their job. So there are some elements of truth. Yeah, this has to be the hardest thing to do because like, what does an 06 do when they're not in command? Like what sort of thing can they be involved with or what project or aircraft are they going to fly? Like yeah. what staff? Yeah. And staff is terrible. <laughs> but here's the thing. Staff is important though. Staffing is so important. I just finished uh, Robert Corum's Boyd. We've talked about that before. It shows the power of staff work, how important it is. Yeah. The ability to get paperwork through the system to affect change. An 06 is a culmination of 20 plus years of experience. Right. That's what I think creates this aura of you can get some stuff done. So, yeah, the idea of the 06, like being completely oblivious and flipping off, you know, like you said, the three star, that that's a little bit much. But, man, they can get away with some stuff, too. So, But not completely off the mark. Yeah, not completely off the mark. Yeah, absolutely. And then I will say, though, this idea that the 06 is the only one that could do the job, especially in a tactical setting with, you know, flying the aircraft. I suppose that's possible, but that is an absolute leadership failure if it's true. This is something that I actually really liked from the film is when they brought in Maverick and they're like, okay, here's this mission. Is it possible? And he's like, well, it's been a while since I've been in an F-18. And the three stars are like, no, you're not here to do it. You're here to teach it. Yes, that is good. That was great. <laughs> Such a good scene. Yeah. And I will say that transition happens a lot sooner than you think. So I'm here as a mid-grade 04, and it is not my job to be hands-on in my tactical unit. Right. And if it is, if I'm hands-on in my tactical unit, something is decidedly broken. Now, there are settings where 04s are the people hands-on tactical, but... Yeah, such as in the aviation world, you know, by the time that you get to 10 years where you're putting on major, like, you've only got, what, really six years of, like, serious flying 
and it has taken that long for you to get that proficient in the jet. So yeah, it makes sense that an 04 might do that in that type of context. But 06 is another 10 years down the road from there. Yeah. So I really did like that sense of teaching and it's going to come sooner than you think. That was definitely a message. But truly, if you are a 36 plus year 06 and you're the only person who can fly the job, something is wrong. You have failed in one of your key duties, which is to build other leaders, to build the next generation. And institutionally, the military, the Navy for the movie, the Air Force, if we're thinking bigger picture, reality has failed if it has produced only one person out of hundreds and thousands of aviators who can do this mission. There's only one person who can do it right, then it's probably not a mission that you want to fly. Period. I find another way to do it. Exactly. And yeah, this is a good place for us to start transitioning a little bit more toward learning the right lessons from Top Gun. You know, the wrong lesson would be that, you know, if you stay in for 36 years, you're going to be able to fly the coolest mission and you're going to be able to, you know, break jets with impunity. You'll be able to, you know, flip off three stars and tell them to, you know, to pound sand and nothing's going to happen to you. Like, those are the wrong lessons from this movie. So let's learn some of the right ones, which is that, okay, so we see in this movie that these officers, the general officers, the three-star, the two-star, this captain, they are focused solely on the accomplishment of the mission. does not matter how it gets done. As long as they take out the target, people can die and everybody's okay with it, you know, as long as mission is accomplished. And that's the sense that we are getting from the discussion, the training, the lead up to the actual mission itself. But we know that that's not true. What is the purpose of the officer? Is it solely to accomplish the mission? No, there is more to it than that. The proximate goal for officers is to accomplish the mission. You know, proximate being the near goal, the short term goal, the thing that you want to accomplish first, achieve first. But the ultimate goal, is to develop people to replace you to accomplish the mission. And that, as you are saying, Reed, is going to begin sooner than you may think. You need to start developing people to replace you well before you become an 06, an 04. You know, you may start as an 01, as a second lieutenant in the Air Force, as an ensign in the Navy. You're going to start at that point to develop your replacements. Because what do we do as leaders? We build more leaders. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Yeah, just again, want to emphasize it happens sooner than you think. Yes, there's a few years there where you can kind of focus on jobbing it out. But boy, that transition happens a lot sooner than you'd expect. And, you know, to be fair to the movie, we see some exceptions to this. There is some people development, you know, it wouldn't be Top Gun without playing on the beach with shirts off, right? And so there's some uh, two-sided football. I don't remember exactly what he called it. You know, offense and defense happening at the exact same time. He called it dog fighting football, I think. Dog fighting football. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Sounds made up to me. Kind of like... Yeah, exactly. Whatever. whatever. <laughs> you know, kind of like Icarus, right? You know, completely made up, whatever. And that's all done under the guise of team building. And maybe that's right. Maybe that is a good way to develop future leaders is to take them to the beach and and play sports or whatever. Um, we also see the, the the interaction between Maverick and Rooster. And, you know, it's kind of kind of a tough love sort of development in that Maverick is getting frustrated with Rooster's like hesitancy, you know, feel, don't think, if you think you're dead kind of thing. That is a type of mentorship and development. And thankfully, Rooster gets there and, you know, it's a great moment in the movie where he's like, why did you do that? Well, I didn't think. Why didn't you think? Because you told me not to. Right? Yeah. <laughs> what were you thinking? Yeah. I wasn't. Yeah. You know, whatever the line is. But we see the development of the character of Rooster into the kind of person that Maverick has mentored him to become. And so it does happen, but that is the exception as opposed to what is the rule actually in the military that you need to be actively involved in the development of your people 
at every stage all throughout the process of trying to accomplish the mission. So again, we need to learn the right lessons and not just be entertained by all of the other really fantastic things that are going on in the movie. Yeah. And two of those final lessons that I think we need to learn, Colin, the right lessons. The cost of this business is often measured in lives. That is something I deeply appreciate from Maverick's character and something that I thought was poignantly true sometimes, even in real life. I have heard discussions about missions, about what we're doing, about, you know, preparation, about a number of aspects. And people just kind of hand wave the fact that lives are at stake. Maverick brought that into reality. I liked that a lot. You know, when they're talking about the mission, they only talked about taking out the target. And then Maverick added, and bring them home, meaning the pilots flying the mission. Mm -hmm. And that was something I thought he did really well and something I don't hear enough and something that I've taken on to highlight that more often. Yeah. You know, and keep our people safe. That kind of, you know, like we play for keeps in this business. So I liked that a lot. But the last one that I wanted to spend just a few more minutes here on it, and in, thank you, audience, for indulging us and staying with us this far. There's a really amazing scene where Maverick is talking to Iceman, and he says, I'm a fighter pilot. It's not what I am. It's who I am. Yeah. Powerful line. Powerful and heavy and multidimensional and packed with all sorts of things we could talk about here. Oof, there's just a lot there. So something for the audience that I've talked about, I want to highlight here. I have added to my definition of career success, the ability at the end to successfully separate my officership and my service from my personal identity. I actually fear and think it's unhealthy to be Maverick in that way. Like, it's who I am. I don't think that's good long-term for people. And it's interesting, Maverick's character doesn't seem to really associate with being a leader or an officer. He associates with being a doer, the do the thing -er. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, what are your thoughts on this idea of it is who I am, it's their identity? What are your thoughts? I mean, in many respects, I feel the same way as Maverick does in that when I think officer, I don't think that's what I am. I think it's who I am. And I struggle at times to separate my non-military self from what I do for the military. And, you know, in many ways that's helpful because it means that, you know, I'm fully invested in what I do, but to what you're saying, there will come a point for every single person. And it has already happened for me multiple times where you will take the uniform off, right? Where you will be done with your military service. And if you find yourself in a situation like Maverick does, where you have no other identity. You have been a fighter pilot your entire career. That's all you've ever done. That's all you ever, all you know. And you leave the military because you separate or retire and you still have, you know, 40, 50, 60 years of life to live and you can't fly an F-18 anymore. Like, what are you going to do? Are you going to be like the high school quarterback who just relives the glory days for the next 60 years? Or are you going to have more to you than that? Are you going to be a multi-layered, multi-dimensional type of person who, who's far more interesting than your senior homecoming football game, right? Yeah. I would hope that there is more. Yeah. And I think that's what I'm trying to highlight. I don't want people to think for a minute that I'm not giving my whole self to this job right now, this effort, this career, this thing that I'm involved in, because I feel that I'm trying to. But like you said, Colin, I don't want to have to look back and say what might have been because that's all I have. You know, I'm trying to develop and grow in other ways. And, and it's complicated. I do want my aviators to be like all in and completely focused and top of their game. But I also want them to have a meaningful, real life outside of that so that when it comes time to hang it up, that they can do so with pride and say, this was an important, meaningful thing for me and it shaped my life. But here is what's next. But yeah, complicated, multicolor emotion ball of, boy, that was a poignant scene and really got those of us who are, you know, in this business thinking. Certainly did for me. I really enjoyed it. Again, if you haven't already, please go see this film. And then again, I do want to add another plug. 
Fighter Pilot Podcast has done a lot of really good things about this movie, and in particular, their review of the Top Gunness of Top Gun with some former Top Gun instructors. <laughs> yeah. uh, really good. I really found that quite yeah. informative, and I think it would be good for you and your time. Any other final thoughts, Colin, before we wrap it up today? You know, just as you're saying, it's a great Hollywood film. Even if you're not in the military, if you have no plans to be in the military, you know, this is a great film for, you know, the the rah-rah, go military, love our brothers and sisters at arms. It's a great film from that perspective. If you do want to join the military, it's a great film because it shows you a lot of really accurate things of, especially if you want to fly, what to expect from that. And then for the rest of us who are not going to be aviators, but do want to serve, we want to be officers, it has some great things that can be learned both from what's accurate and what's inaccurate. As long as we have our eyes open and we're paying attention, I think that this film will be one that is continually rewatched. It will be brought up in our commissioning sources. You know, we'll pick apart different scenes and, and rightly so. I think that Hollywood has done its job here and the Navy with them as the service partner in the creation of the movie. And so I'm grateful that it was made. I just want to make sure that we are learning the right lessons and so that we can find ourselves better, more effective, more lethal, and to this last point that we can see what it's like if this is all we ever do. So let's make the effort to be more than just officers, more than just pilots. Let's be good people all around everywhere we find ourselves and find success that way. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you for joining us on this week's episode. Thanks for indulging us on this little adventure. It was fun for Colin and I. We had watched this film separately and then immediately message each other, like, we got to watch this again, and I'm taking notes this time. And mm -hmm. so that was a lot of fun. Gave me a great excuse, you know, to go watch this film again. And uh, thank you for joining us. We love hearing from you. I will say the email and Facebook messages have ticked up lately, and that is not a problem. We sure appreciate hearing from you. Please reach out. We're always happy to answer any questions we can. And that'll do it for this week's episode of Commission Net. Commission Net.